talk about policy shifts in poverty, then it's important to go back and look at our economic basis. When we were primarily agrarian, we measured wealth in land, cattle, and children. You didn't have to go to school to make a living. On paper, we represented wealth with a deed. A deed was what you could take to the bank and borrow money against your assets. And human capacity was developed largely by the family and the church. When we became industrial, we took that same concept across. We represented wealth on paper, though, by calling it a stock certificate. And human capacity was developed largely by institutions, schools, companies, etc. And again, you didn't have to go to school to make a living. Now we're in a knowledge-based economy since 1972. And in the business community, they call it intellectual capital. People make money out of their head. Think about Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. And in that process, we've had a hard time figuring out how to represent wealth on paper. How do you represent talent? How do you represent expertise? Well, the closest we have is whether or not you have a college degree. But everybody knows people with college degrees, and they don't have any intellectual capital. In fact, that's one of the reasons Google has quit looking for a college degree as part of their hiring process. So how you represent wealth now, in the school business, we start talking about standards and assessments. In the social work field, we talk about outcomes. But the real issue is you have to go to school to make a living. And number two, institutions alone can no longer develop human capacity. You have to involve your whole community. And here's why institutions alone can no longer do it. Number one, the neighborhood effects are too intense. Number two, all the social media has put us in a virtual community. And number three, High mobility makes it more likely that individuals will not ever be part of an intact physical community. Having said that now, I'm going to suggest some shifts in a policy frame for addressing poverty. Number one, and I call this chart moving from to moving to. So number one, we need to move away from defining poverty as money, and to define it as a set of resources, as we do in Bridges. In Hurricane Katrina, they found that the people who made it out of poor neighborhoods versus the people who didn't make it out had more social capital. It wasn't about money. The second shift we need to do is right now, we measure and talk about poverty programs in terms of maintenance. In other words, are people getting by? Do they have enough money to eat? Do they have enough money for utilities? We should be talking about poverty as a transition. Are you moving to stability? Are you developing your own resources? Those are critical pieces. We should be moving and measuring those instead of maintenance. There's a saying, and it's this, whatever gets measured gets monitored we should be measuring things differently. The third thing we need to do is look at models of compliance and standardization. We need to move away from models of compliance and standardization, cookie cutter models, if you will. Those indeed are what you use in the industrial era to build capacity, but they don't work to develop talent and expertise we need to move to human capacity models. How do you develop capacity? How do you develop expertise, talent? That's a much more productive thing. The th next thing we need to do is stop serving individuals in poverty in a way that we ask them to meet our institutional goals. We really should be serving them in such a way that they can develop their talents and strengths and contribute to the capital of the community and their own capacity. We're going to define human capacity as the ability to create your own resource base.
as we look at what else we need to move from to, we're going to say that it's going to be important to move away from models that only address under-resourced individuals and don't invite them to the table to participate, to models where you educate both resourced and under-resourced and they are together at the decision-making table. What we do right now with adults in poverty is analogous to the next example I'm going to give you. Let's suppose that men had a conference about women, but they didn't invite any women. But they came up with all these solutions for women to do. And then, when they didn't work, the men said, those stupid women. Well, that's basically what we do with adults in poverty. We make decisions for them, never invite them to the table to help make the decisions. And then when they don't work, we say, those stupid individuals. In fact, one of the examples is when individuals go through getting ahead, we ask them if they will then go back to their communities and volunteer, be part of their community decision making. One of the women who went through getting ahead had been in extreme poverty. She was homeless at one period of time, so she wanted to be on the homeless shelter board. Well, one of the things the homeless shelter board decided to do was to send letters to everybody in the community telling them what to do if they were homeless. She said to the board, and what address would you be using? It's an example of decisions that are made without understanding the reality. We need to move away from cutoffs. There's something that's being discussed right now called the financial cliff. In other words, when you get to a certain level of benefits, then you're cut off of all your benefits and you're actually in worse shape than you were had you not tried to get out on your own. So what we suggest to legislatures is that policy needs to move to a ladder of benefits, a ladder of support. And as you go up the rungs of the ladder, it's not until you're all the way to the top of the ladder when what you're making is equal to the benefits you would have received that people are actually cut off. Otherwise, it creates more chaos and more problems than it did before. Currently, our models give resources, but they don't develop knowledge bases and they don't develop relationships of people different than you are. We are going to say that that's the opposite of what should happen. What should happen is you provide knowledge and relationships and allowing them then to begin to create their own resources. It's a flip side of the coin, but it's the more powerful one. It's the old argument. Do you give them fish or you teach them to fish? And it's the model that is most productive and helps people transition. In closing, as we think about what we're moving from to what we're moving to, we're really moving to models that help individuals survive and thrive in an intellectual capital era in a knowledge-based economy. And as we implement those policies, we'll all be better off for it.